Hello, this is Professor Kitch, and welcome to my webcast series on the triaxial consolidated undrained test. This series is on the actual lab performance of the test, not on a theory. The theory is covered in a different webcast. This series is divided into four separate video segments, parts one through four. This particular segment, part one, we're going to cover the preparation of the specimen. Hello, this is Professor Kitch, and welcome to my webcast on triaxial testing. In this webcast, we're going to be covering a consolidated, undrained triaxial test, but the setup and prep is going to be the same for any triaxial test. Before we get started on the details of the webcast, I'd like to go over all the pieces of the system we'll be using today as we set up this test. So here we have our triaxial cell that will hold our specimen that we're going to test and allow us to provide confining stress to the outside of the specimen as, all, as well as to control the pore pressure on the inside of the specimen. This cell will be connected up to this triaxial panel. This panel has a bunch of different stations on it, but we'll be using three of them. We'll be using these three right here. Each one will be connected to a different part of the triaxial cell. This allows us to apply either pressure or vacuum to the triaxial cell to control the stresses both inside and outside the specimen. One section will be connected to the cell itself outside the specimen. A second section will be connected to the bottom of the triaxial specimen. And then this third cell will be connected to the top of the triaxial system. We also have our loading frame here. This will provide the, the load on the top of the specimen when we go to actually do the, the triaxial test. And we have our data acquisition system over here. This is a geotac slash trout wine system sold by a company in Houston. And it's an automated system that will automatically do the loading and take all our data for us. Another device that you can't quite see this outside the frame here a little bit is our reservoir. This reservoir holds our de-aired water for our system. It's important that we use de-aired water when preparing this set specimen. Otherwise, we'll have problems with saturation. So that's a quick overview of the system. The things that we're going to be measuring during this are pore pressures. We have two pore pressure transducers on the cell. There's one here which will actually be measuring the pore pressure inside the specimen or the, the actual pore pressure of the specimen itself. There's one here at the top will be, which will be measuring the pressure in the cell itself or that stress on the outside of the specimen. And then in the load frame, we have a load cell here which will be measuring the force downward on the piston as we test. And then at the very top, we have a displacement measuring device, which will measure the deformation or movement of this piston down into the specimen during the test. So that's a quick overview of the whole system. Those are all its pieces and parts. And now we'll get into some details. Before I assemble the triaxial cell with the real specimen in it, I want to do a quick overview of all the parts of the cell and how it goes together. The main parts of the cell are the base, the cylindrical side walls, and the top. These three rods connect the top to the base and hold the cell together. If I take these apart, we can take a closer look at the parts of the cell. First, let's take a closer look at the base of the cell. The base of the cell has these four valves plus a fifth port here. These two red valves are connected to these to two tubes that go in near the center of the base, and the two black valves are connected to these two tubes that go to the outside of the base. The two red valves are connected to this pedestal that goes that's on the bottom of the base, and they're connected to these two drainage ports in the pedestal. This will be connected hydraulically to the base of the sample. So the two red valves are going to be connected to the base of the sample. The two black valves are connected to these drainage lines, which will be put on the top of the sample. So the black valves will be connected to the top of the sample. The red valves will be connected to the base of the sample. This fifth port is connected to this small hole right here, which allows fluid to be pushed into the cell or taken out of the cell itself. That's the fluid outside the specimen. So the red valves are connected to the pore fluid inside the specimen at the base. The black valves connected to the, to the pore water in the specimen at the top. And the center port 
connected to the cell fluid outside that's going to pressurize the cell. Now when we assemble the, the specimen, it'll go in a sequence something like this. We have our base pedestal, and on top of that we'll go a porous stone. On top of a porous stone we'll go a piece of filter paper. And on top of that we'll go our soil specimen. I'm just using this foam dummy specimen to illustrate. On top of the specimen we'll have another piece of filter paper. And on top of that another porous stone. On top of that whole assembly goes our top cap. Now we need to separate the soil specimen from the fluid outside the specimen that's going to be used to confine it. And to do that, we're going to place a membrane, a latex membrane like this, around the outside of this specimen. So I'm going to take this membrane, stretch it, and put it over the outside of the specimen. We have a special tool to do that, and I'll show it to you later. But for right now, you can imagine that this latex membrane is completely surrounding the specimen all the way around. And we'll seal that membrane off to the top cap and the, and the pedestal. And once I have that done, I can connect these two drainage lines to the top of the specimen. Again, so the red lines are connected to the base, the black lines are connected to the top. Once I have that all assembled, I can put the cylindrical sidewalls back on the cell. And I can put the top on the cell. When I put the top on the cell, I'll be careful to make sure that the loading piston is connected to the cap. And once I have that all assembled, I can put the rods back on to hold the top to the bottom. And I'll have a completely assembled triaxial cell with the specimen inside, and we're ready to go. Now we're going to trim our specimen and get it ready to go into the triaxial cell. To do this, you'll need your specimen. Uh, you'll need a water content tin because we'll take the trimmings from the specimen to get a water content of the, of the specimen before the test. This you'll have to have already taken a tear weight and recorded that on your data sheet. You'll need a good soil knife so you can do the trimming. And then you'll need some kind of a device to help you get a good square edge on the specimen. We're using this cylindrical trimming device. There's other ones that are rectangular shaped, but you just need something that's sort of like a miter box to allow you to get a really square edge. So we're going to carefully remove our specimen from this wrapping. Your specimen may come in a different form. It could be that you extrude it from a Shelby tube. This particular specimen has already been extruded for us. It also could be that you have to trim it into a cylindrical shape on a soil lathe before you start. In this case, ours is already, that's already been done for us. So I'm going to just loosen this trimming device and carefully slide it over the specimen without damaging it. And then what I'm going to do is push it so it just sticks out over the end of the trimming device just a little bit, just enough that I can trim it off. And I'm going to tighten this down. Not very tight, I'm just going to tighten it enough that the specimen doesn't slide around. This works really well for this kind of specimen, for a very soft specimen. You can't really trim it with um, a wraparound device like this. And then I'm going to take my soil knife. And I'm going to start trimming the specimen. And I'll trim it over the water content tin. Now you want to start at the edge of the specimen and work your way into the middle. You don't want to just start and take one big cut all the way across the top because you'll rip the specimen and you won't have a good smooth surface at the top when, when you're done. Didn't have that adjusted quite right. There we go. And so you trim slowly from the edge. Work your way in towards the center. You don't need to worry about getting all of the trimmings into the water content tin. We just need enough to get a water content measurement. I'm keeping my knife on the edges of this trimming device so that I trim it nice and flat with the edge.
Now I've got a nice flat edge on that side. Now I just need to trim the other side. Again, extrude that just a little bit outside there. Continue the same process on the other end. That's flush with the edge. And now I have my specimen all trimmed. I'm going to loosen this miter box. Take it off carefully without disturbing the specimen. And there we go. Here's my specimen all trimmed up and ready. Now I just need to measure the height and the diameter of it. And I'll take this water content tin over to the scale right now and get a weight of the moist soil and the water content tin so I can put it in the oven and then just get a water content. So that's the trimming part. So I've trimmed my specimen at the top and at the bottom and removed it from this trimming device. And now I'm ready just to get the dimensions of this specimen. I want to measure both the height of the specimen and its diameter. To measure the height, I'll just use a set of digital calipers. It's fairly easy to use. You have to be careful holding your specimen so you don't damage it. I just put the calipers at the top, try to measure, right down that measurement. I'm going to take three different measurements at approximately 120 degrees apart. All right, so now I know the height of the specimen. Now I just need to know its diameter. Now we could try and put outside calipers on it to measure its diameter, but there's actually a much more accurate way to do that. And that's with this device called a pie tape. So we're going to wrap this tape around the specimen. And uh, you'll obviously say, well, that's not going to give me the diameter. That's going to give me the circumference. And it is. It's actually measuring the circumference. But the scale of this is not uh, a regular scale. This, this one measures in inches, but the space between these marks is not inches. It's inches divided by 2 pi, so that when I measure the, the circumference, it's going to directly read off the scale, the diameter. So it's called a pie tape. It's actually very accurate. It's accurate to at least three significant figures. It, we use a little vernier technology with this to read it, if you're familiar with reading verniers. Again, I'm going to take three measurements. One about a quarter of the way down from the top. that measurement, record that on my data sheet, one at the middle, record that on my data sheet, and one at the base, a quarter of the way at the base, Put that on my data sheet. All right. So I now have my specimen all trimmed. I've measured its height three times. I'll average those for a height. I measure the diameter in three places. I'll average those to get an average diameter. And now the last thing I'm going to do is take this over to the scale and get a weight of the, of the specimen before we start the test.